Hi, this is Ray Moss Elder. Vonette Bright has gone home. A little boy of 10 was heard to say to his father at his mother's funeral, well, maybe she was an angel and God just loaned her to us for a while. People in many parts of the world still say that today about Vonette Bright, who went home to be with the Lord and to be reunited with her husband, Bill, on December 23rd, 2015. One of my closest forever friends is a former high school student of mine who I had the joy of directing in many plays. His name is Jim Delarm. Jim is the brother of Grace Stoddard, who was Bill Bright's personal secretary for a number of years. Jim wrote me about a couple of memories among the multitude of memories that he has about Vonette. Jim wrote, I very much recall Vonette, right? Vonette was from Minnesota, I believe. A wonderful and very gracious, special woman. She once kidded me when I asked a teen about the Campus Crusades cabin at Lake Mears some mile or less away from Forest Home Christian Conference Center in the Southern California mountains above Big Bear. We were all headed there to spend a couple days. We were riding in the same car. I was just about ready to bundle up and get tough, but I asked Vonette how rustic the cabin was. She said to me, well, Jim, you could just about spit between the logs. <laughs> but when we arrived, I saw a very well-equipped, quite modern cabin with all the amenities of a nice home. Vonette and I were working together in the large garage at 110 Stone Canyon Drive on Sunset Boulevard across from UCLA. We were both working up a sweat, handling boxes and other stored things. She stops and tells me, I have to go in. There were no cell phones in 1959 or 1960. And check if my baby is born yet. Well, for a 16, 17 year old kid, I was worried that I'd worked her too hard on her day of delivery. And she sure seemed entirely too agile, slim, cheerful, and spontaneous to be a brand new mom. When she later told me it was a wonderful and precious adoption and that she was not the birth mother, but ecstatic, tearful, and delighted to be a new mom, I understood that maybe was a baby that had a brother both nurtured and grew up in the wonderful family of a famous former candy baron who then turned out to be a highly respected famous ambassador and teacher and evangelist for Christ, as did Vonette. Bill Bright founded the famous Campus Crusade for Christ ministry with chapters on many, many college campuses, both nationally and internationally to this day. Jim says, yes, I remember her and I remember Jim. <laughs> Here's how the co-founder of Campus Crusade for Christ came to know Jesus. Vanette Zachary grew up thinking she was a Christian. As she maintained high moral standards for herself in college. But there was one thing she lacked, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The eldest of four children, she grew up in a happy, quintessentially American home in Coweta, Oklahoma. Her church background motivated her to strive for goodness and moral purity. But in college, her confidence in Christianity faltered and she began to question her faith. My prayers seem shallow and ineffective. In high school, my major interest centered on church-related activities, but in those early days, 
of college, Bible reading was meaningless. Doubts came and I was not faithful in church attendance, she wrote later. One day after her freshman year in college, she received a letter from a former classmate from her hometown in Oklahoma, Bill Bright. I remembered him from our school days and was impressed by a speech I'd heard him deliver when I was in the seventh grade. Bill was establishing himself in business in California, and his stationery read Bright's California Confections. Vanette read the letter several times before she shared it with her father. When her father read it, he said, well, our hometown boy has gone away and made good. Now he's going to come home for his bride. Surprisingly, she decided not to respond to his letter. I decided I would not allow William R. Bright to think I was thrilled to hear from him, so I ignored the letter. Months went by, and she resumed her college classes. But as she cleaned out a desk drawer one day, she rediscovered the letter. After she told her roommate about the curious young man from her hometown, the roommate insisted that she should write to him. She hadn't seen Bill in three years, but she spent that evening writing a 10-page response to his original missive. It began, or part of it at least, contained... No, this was not contained. I can hardly contain this story. It's so great. That was the beginning of a beautiful romance in which the correspondence flourished as we began to write daily. I received flowers, candy, a telegram, or telephone call every week. My long-distance courtship became the talk of campus. I was truly swept off my feet, she recounted. When Bill came to visit, they had a delightful time together, and Bill quickly brought matters to a head. After talking about what had happened in the years since we had seen each other, Bill proposed marriage, and I accepted. But soon it became apparent to both that Vonette did not share Bill's passionate faith in Jesus. As we continued our relationship over the next three years, many spiritual questions plagued me. Bill had a deep religious faith. He sent me passages of scripture to read, but they just did not have the same meaning to me as they did to him. He would also ask me to pray about concerns. And I began to realize I was engaged to a man to whom Christ meant a great deal. And yet he wasn't real to me. I decided Bill had become a religious fanatic and that somehow he must be rescued from this fanaticism. And at the same time, Bill was beginning to think that perhaps I wasn't a Christian. He knew he couldn't marry me until there was a change in my spiritual life. When Vonnet graduated from college, she was already engaged to Bill, but doubts about the relationship continued to plague her thoughts. And then Bill invited Vonette to travel to California for a Christian conference. My parents were opposed to my going, even though our engagement had been announced and the marriage was planned for September, she recalled. As she walked across the stage to receive her degree, she decided she would accept Bill's invitation to California. My motive was to save Bill from the influence of those I considered fanatics. Unknown to me, Bill's motive was for me to find Christ. After her arrival in LA, they went to the college conference at Forest Home, a Christian conference center in the Southern California foothills. Vonette was surprised to meet many on fire Christians. I met young people who possessed a quality of life 
I had never seen. They vibrantly shared their faith. Their statements annoyed me because I felt that Christianity was something personal that you didn't freely discuss. I tried to put their comments out of my mind, and yet I admired them and liked their quality of life. Afterward, as they discussed the difference in these young people, Vonette came to the sad conclusion that Bill's faith was right for him, but it wouldn't work for her. I knew I didn't want to stand in the way of his relationship with God. So I concluded that perhaps the best thing to do was simply bow out of his life. At the end of the week, I would return his ring and we would go our separate ways, she decided. But he was not ready to give up easily. Bill had a secret weapon in his arsenal. He arranged for Vonette to meet with Dr. Henrietta Mears, the highly impactful and inspirational leader of the 6,000 member Sunday School at First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. Miss Mears was expecting me, and what I didn't know was that the entire staff was praying for me. Miss Mears explained that she had taught chemistry in Minneapolis and that she could understand how I was thinking. I had minored in chemistry in college, so everything had to be practical and logical to me. Mears told Bonnet that God loved her, and if she was the only person in the entire world, he would have done everything he could to make himself known to her. God has a plan and a purpose for you that's far beyond anything you can possibly imagine, she told her. But before you can know that plan and purpose, it is necessary for you to know God. Mary said the reason man does not know God is that he is sinful and separated from God. Speak for yourself, Vonette thought to herself. That doesn't apply to me. I've worked at this business of being a good girl. Then Mir showed her Romans 3.23. All had sinned. All fall short of God's glorious standard. Mears explained that sin is falling short of God's perfect standard and breaking his rules for living. I had to admit that I fell short of this standard. And even my own standard, many times, Vanette had been striving desperately to be a good person. Next, Mears read Romans 6.23. The wages, the result of sin falling short of God's standard is death, spiritual separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then Miss Mears read John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. But then realized that her attempts to live a good life, keep a high moral standard, and attend church fell short. In spite of these things, there was still something missing in her life. I admitted that perhaps Jesus Christ was the ingredient I was missing. I turned to Miss Mears and asked, if Jesus Christ is the way, then how can I know him? Mears responded in Revelation 3.20. Christ says, look, here I stand at the door, the entrance to your heart and life and knock. If you hear me calling and open the door, I will come in 
and we will share a meal as friends. Receiving Christ is a matter of turning your life completely over to him. Your will, your emotions, your intellect. It's as if we walk out of our lives and Jesus Christ walks in. He takes control. Bonnet suddenly realized that if what she said was true, she had nothing to lose and everything to gain by following Jesus. I bowed my head to pray, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and take control. And at that moment, God became reality in my life. Immediately after she received Christ, God gave her a remarkable dream. The picture that came to my mind was one I shall never forget. I was standing in utter darkness on the edge of a diving board. I don't swim. As a matter of fact, I almost lost my life in a swimming course in college. I passed the course, but have not jumped off a diving board since. In the dream, I didn't know whether or not I could swim, but I knew I had to jump. And I found out that I could swim and that God is real. I gave him all my trust, and he didn't fail me. Bonnet began to notice striking changes after she was born again and became a new creature in Christ. God's direction in my life became a reality as I found my strong will and temper easier to control. The Bible became a living book and a guide for my life. I couldn't have imagined how the decision I had made would impact the rest of my life, but it has and it is continuing to be the greatest influence, she wrote later. Bill and Bonnet were married a short time later and their great adventure began. Soon after the nuptials, Bonnet was awakened by Bill with tears streaming down his face. He told her he decided to quit seminary only a month before graduation, sell their yellow convertible and his businesses, and spend the rest of his life telling others about Jesus. God had given him a vision to launch Campus Crusade for Christ. Still groggy, Bonnet said, Bill, I think you're overreacting. Unsure of this new calling, Bonnet prayed, if Bill is right, and this is right, I pray that you'll give me a heart to respond. I sensed an invisible altar waiting somewhere ahead. Gradually, the Lord Jesus answered my prayer. And I became willing to put my sacrifices on that altar. My master's degree, my career, my book manuscript. Bill and Vanette's new ministry was bathed in prayer. Bill and I recruited everyone we could think of to serve as prayer partners. We worked to fill every 15 minute slot and have around the clock prayer. We wanted to know that someone somewhere was uniting in prayer for this ministry. Campus Crusade was born in prayer and prayer is still our lifeline. Soon the Bright family grew to include Zach and Brad. The ministry grew to campuses across the country and launched internationally. In 1965, Bill wrote a little track originally called, Have You Heard of the Four Spiritual Laws? This small yellow booklet has been translated into more than 200 languages. Campus Crusade grew to more than 100 countries and launched more ministries like Athletes in Action and the Jesus Film Project. 
In 1988, Vonette introduced legislation for the National Day of Prayer, signed by President Ronald Reagan. She served on the National Day of Prayer Task Force from 1982 until 1990. I know beyond a doubt that God moved upon my heart with a realization that through united, specific, and earnest prayer, we can move the hand of God and have a part in helping change the world. Thanks to Vonette's efforts, today tens of thousands of events are held nationwide for the National Day of Prayer. In 1993, Vonette launched Women Today International and its radio program now aired on more than 486 stations. In 2003, after a valiant fight with lung disease, Bill was called home. And Vonette carried on their commitments to helping fulfill the Great Commission until she joined her beloved Bill and her awaiting Savior, December 23rd, 2015. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Bonnet and Bill. We're all going home someday. Just depends on which home. Be sure you know Christ as your only God and your only Savior. <laughs>